based forwarding is that we basically can override the routing function or the routing decision made by the routing table. So for instance, here we have a default route pointing out to ISP number one, right? And now if we use policy based forwarding, we can, for instance, say, you know, okay, now traffic for, from a specific subnet actually goes out of ISP two. Okay. Now, this use case of having two in independent ISPs is actually one of the most common um, you know, usages for policy-based forwarding. So let's have a look at this a little bit more in detail. So again, let's have the, the case that we have two independent ISPs and what we want to achieve is, first of all, get a redundancy, right? If, if one ISP fails, all the traffic should fall over to the other one. And then ideally also, actually get a bit of a load balancing, meaning, you know, use both ISP at, at the same time um, so that we are basically fully utilizing all the resources which are available. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, first of all, here on our firewall, we have layer tray interface, right, on the inside, on the outside, one dedicated one per ISP. And then we, of course, have our virtual router. So now the first thing what we could simply do without any policy-based forwarding um, is to define a default route for each ISP, right? So uh, let's say here we have the kind of the router of the ISP, which is our next hop, right? And then what we can do is define a default route which points to this ISP, okay? So the first one here. And then another default route also pointing to the second ISP. Now, you know, two default routes on the same virtual router, mm, now we can have a problem because, you know, the virtual router has to make a decision. Do I send it to ISP1 or ISP2, right? And so we need kind of something uh, based on which we can decide with a precedence, right? And for this, we can use a metric, okay? So we can assign to different routes a different metric. So let's say here we use a metric of 10, which is the default. And then for the second, we actually use a higher metric of 20. Okay, so with this now, by default, all traffic arriving here to the virtual router would be sent out of ISP1, right? And then only if this route goes down, right, everything would then route over to ISP2. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that, you know, for this route to go down, um, you know, the, the only reason would be that this interface goes down, okay? So now, and that's not really a good test for availability of the internet, right? Because in most environments, uh, you would probably have here an internet switch, right? And only if this internet switch goes down, this interface gonna go down. However, if the ISP's router, maybe even the circuit is down, then, uh, you know, then the, the interface is still up, the route is still active, the file would send out the traffic there and nothing fell over. So that's not really a good uh, implementation, okay? So now, from here, what we can do, however, is use a new feature called Root Path Monitoring. And that's a new feature which was introduced in version 8. Okay, now root pass monitoring is very powerful because what we can now do is we can apply, let's say, a monitoring profile to the root itself where we're saying, right, um, ping or send out pings out to the internet from a specific source IP, so for instance, our ISP interface, and then ping various IP addresses on the internet and see if they are available, right? And if they are not, right, then cause a failure condition, which then causes the root to be deactivated, and in this case, the next root would kick in, which is then the default root here, right? So now the root path monitoring, obviously this has nothing to do with policy-based routing, also because we didn't touch yet really on policy-based routing, um, but for the scenario, if you want to have very simple um, failover of the ISPs, the root path monitoring that's the solution to go with because it's very simple uh, and very effective, okay? Now, if we have now our, have a use case which is a little bit more complex, like for instance, we would like to use actually both ISP at the same time. So send a bit of traffic out over ISP1 and another you know, bit of traffic out of ISP2 to effectively use our resources. In this case, now we need kind of a bigger gun, which is actually policy-based routing.
So now, in order to apply our policy-based routing to this, what do we need to do? So first of all, uh, we're going to remove this root. Okay, so this default root to ISP1, we're going to remove. So I'm going to remove all of this, including obviously the pass monitoring. We're not going to need this now. And this default root, that's going to be our, our primary default root, right? So our primary default root points to the secondary ISP. Okay, so and we can change kind of the metric here as well to the default metric of 10. So, and now we use policy-based forwarding, right, to define a policy which basically says, well, all traffic which should go out to the internet sh should actually be sent to the next hub ISP1. Okay, now, what is the big difference? Well, first of all, with policy-based forwarding, uh, we can apply an, a monitor as well. Okay, so similar like to the path monitoring, you know, we can now say, right, uh, try to reach certain IP addresses on the internet, and only if they are reachable, only then this rule uh, is active. Okay, so with this, we have here our policy based forwarding. Okay, basically being kind of overwriting the routing decision and kind of redirecting all traffic out, and then if the monitor of the, of the policy-based forwarding fails, then you know the default route will kick in and route all of the traffic out of ISP2. Now, obviously, this setup now would be exactly the same like our pass monitoring, right? So there is not really uh, much change here, right? Um, however, um, what we can now do is we can now also kind of define more granular rules to basically say, you know, certain traffic should go off ISP2. So, for instance, let's say we have a guest Wi-Fi. And this guest Wi-Fi is going to have a dedicated network. which is 192.168.60.0.24, right? So this network is now here connected to our firewall as well, nicely separated, of course, right? And now here connects to our virtual router, okay? So and now what we can do is obviously policy-based forwarding, as the name says, it's a policy which we define with match criteria where we can basically say, right, uh, traffic from certain des a certain source IPs, for instance, like this guest Wi-Fi, right? We can send out here meaning we would now define um, a dedicated policy-based forwarding rule um, just for the, the guest Wi-Fi. So this is now a PBF rule, policy-based forwarding. Just for the guest Wi-Fi. Okay, so and this is now again very granular and gives us a, a lot of, you know, a lot of use cases what we can do for traffic engineering. In a setup, however, we have to be careful because what we have to consider is that policy-based forwarding does not apply to traffic originating from the firewall. Now, what does this mean? Let's say here on the internet we have another firewall from, let's say, a partner organization, right? And to this firewall we establish a site-to-site -site VPN. Okay, so site to site VPN, and we decide now, you know, kind of ISP1, let's say that's our most stable internet connection, so we want, you know, that this VPN is kind of goes to, um, goes to this interface, okay, so this public IP address. Now, what is the problem? Okay, so traffic from this VPN arrives on this interface, and that's okay, right, but now the return traffic, right, again, originates from the firewall because uh, the, the PIP address of this VPN is the firewall itself, okay? But the return traffic will not match against policy-based forwarding, means it just makes a decision of the normal routing table, meaning that return traffic would not now go down, go out of ISP2, okay? So now we have asynchronous routing, so that the traffic which we send out of ISP2, the source IP would actually be the IP address of ISP1. Okay, so effectively from a communication flow point of view, it would kind of look like this, right? So inbound traffic goes comes that way, and then return traffic is actually sent this way. Okay, so depending on your ISP, this might even work. All right, that's kind of the crazy thing about this, right? <laughs> uh, because you know this ISP, you know you have you have an IP address of this ISP on this interface. 
Okay. Now, when the traffic is sent out of the firewall, the source IP will be the IP address of this layer tree interface, and it will be sent out to ISP2. And now the destination IP address is the firewall on this side, so gonna reach this firewall, and it's gonna go back, right? So unless this ISP is doing source IP checking, which they should do, and most ISPs, by the way, today are doing this, right? Um, then the traffic would actually go through. And this would be the, even worse because with this, the VPN tunnel would work. Uh, but it wouldn't work proper because you have kind of asynchronous routing, you have delays between packets. So you're definitely going to run into trouble with traffic traversing onto this VPN, right? And then, you know, not directly will you actually see that this problem is actually related to the VPN, okay? So th this is where we have to be very careful. And how do we, how do we solve this problem? So the way we're going to fix this actually is by setting up dedicated virtual routers for each ISP. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of here of our default virtual router. Uh, and instead what we're going to set up is a dedicated virtual router per ISP. Okay, so we have here now our virtual router for ISP1. We have another virtual router for ISP2 and we're going to set up a virtual router as well for our internal network. Okay, so now on these virtual routers we can always now define a default route pointing out outbound. Okay, so here we have then again kind of a default route pointing to ISPs1 router and then here obviously we still have our default route uh, which we're gonna actually leave in right it's pointing to ISP2 so and now on our virtual router over here our internal virtual router what we do is we now have a default route pointing over here to this virtual router so we do inter VR routing okay so here we have this is now our our default route okay and then on these virtual routers, we just kind of put a route back pointing to the internal network. Okay, so we basically, you know, on, on each of these, just add a route saying that the internal network, so 192.168.70.0 and 192.168.60.0/24 is reachable via the internal virtual router. Okay, and um, for simplicity's sake, what you can do as well is actually just point all private IP addresses, so 10.0.0/8, and and 172.16.0/12, right? All of these private IP addresses, you can just point them down here, right? Um, so that they are always reachable via the internal virtual router, right? So with this, we fix the problem because now, if traffic arrives from this VPN on our firewall, right, then it will just follow the default route, which points it back to ISP1, and everything goes back and forth. Okay, so with this, you know, we don't have this problem. And having such a, you know, clean separation with multiple ISPs, I think it's very important. Um, such a side VPNs is just one example. Another example would also be global protect remote access VPNs. Okay, so for instance, um, if you want to have a failover for remote access VPNs, right, and you want to use kind of both interfaces for this, then, then that this is really the only solution for this. Obviously, you can see there's a little bit more complex, um, but, you know, having two ISPs and taking full uh, the full resource usage out of them um, always is a little bit more complex from a routing point of view, right? And, you know, this would be an appropriate solution for it. Obviously, technically, when, when you think about this, in theory, you could also just use two virtual routers, so kind of one virtual router on the inside, right, for ISP2 and one for the for this one, right? So this would work as well. Uh, um, however, I, from a best practice point of view, would always prefer to have three set up because it's a cleaner separation, right? So one per ISP and internal, and unless you have kind of limitations and running out of virtual routers on your firewall, uh, I would always recommend you to, to set up this scenario using... We'll